Okay, welcome to day two of My Side of the Mountain. Today we're going to be reading the first two chapters, but before we read, I want to give you a little background for the story. So I'm going to present this here. Okay, and so here are just some images from the story I wanted you to get familiar with. First of all, he talks about being in a hemlock tree, and this right here in this first picture up in the top corner is a picture of like a hemlock grove. And here is an example of a tree this, being hollowed out inside almost like a cave. He talks about that. And then he also talks about a fire starter, and that's the flint with a blade on it. And if you strike the blade against the flint, it makes sparks, and then you can light stuff on fire. Again, don't try that at home. That's not something you should be doing. Um, but again, that's what he's talking about when he's talking about the flint. And down here, this big picture is a picture of the Catskill Mountains, which is where the story is taking place. And then he does talk about a weasel, the barren weasel, and that's a weasel. Oh, so cute. Um, and then finally, Frightful, the falcon, and that's a picture of a falcon. So that's just some background before we start reading today. So I'm going to start reading. And hey, hopefully you've did your vocabulary from yesterday. So again, this is my side of the mountain. And we're going to start off on chapter one, in which I hole up in a snowstorm. I am on a mountain in a tree home that people have passed without ever knowing that I am here. The house is a hemlock tree, six feet in diameter, and must be as old as the mountain itself. I came upon it last summer and dug and burned it out until I made a snug cave in the tree that I now call home. My bed is on the right as you enter and is made of ash slats and covered with deer skin. On the left is a small fireplace about knee high. It is of clay and stones. It has a chimney that leads the smoke out through a knot hole. I chipped out three other knot holes to let fresh air in. The air coming in is bitter cold. It must be below zero outside, and yet I can sit here inside my tree and write with bare hands. The fire, oops, bare hands, oh. Now I lost my spot. Dun, 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 dun. The fire is small too. It doesn't take much to fire to warm this tree room. It is the 4th of December, I think. It may be the 5th. I am not sure because I have not recently counted the notches in the aspen pole that is my calendar. I have been too busy gathering nuts and berries, smoking venison, and venison is deer, fish, and small game to keep up with the exact date. And so we're getting a preview that he is, you know, he's living in a tree. We know he's living on the land and it's cold. It's winter. It's December. The lamp I'm riding by is deer fat poured into a turtle shell with a strip of old city trousers for a wick. It snowed all day yesterday and today, and I've not been outside since the store began. And I am bored for the first time since I ran away from home eight months ago to live on the land. So we're not finding out, we're finding out some more things, right? He's run away from home. He's been living there for eight months and he's actually bored for the first time. I am well and healthy. The food is good. Sometimes I eat turtle soup and I know how to make acorn pancakes. I keep my supplies in the wall of the tree in wooden pockets that I chopped myself. Every time I have looked at those pockets during the last two days, I have felt just like a squirrel, which reminds me, I didn't see a squirrel one whole day before the storm began. I guess they are holed up and eating their stored nuts too. I wonder if the baron, that's the wild weasel who lives up behind the big boulder to the north of my tree, is also denned up. Well, anyway, I think the storm is dying down because the tree is not crying so much. Ooh, and what is, the tree is not crying. We kind of, what, what do we call that? What kind of figurative language is that? Personification. The tree is not crying. When the wind really blows, the whole tree moans right down to the roots, which is where I'm at. Oh, the tree is moaning again. Again, that's another example of personification. Tomorrow, I hope that the Baron and I can tunnel out into the sunlight I wonder if I should dig the snow, but that would mean I would have to put it somewhere. And the only place to put it is in my nice snug tree. Maybe I can pack it with my hands as I go. 
I've always dug into the snow from the top, never from under. The Baron must dig up from under the snow. I wonder where he puts what he digs. Well, I guess I'll know in the morning. When I wrote that last winter, I was scared and thought maybe I'd never get out of my tree. I had been scared two days ever since the first blizzard hit the Catskill Mountains. When I came up to the sunlight, which I did by simply poking my head into the soft snow and standing up, I laughed at my dark fears. Everything was white, clean, shining, and beautiful. The sky was blue, blue, blue. The hemlock grove was laced with snow. The meadow was smooth and white, and the gorge was sparkling with ice. It was so beautiful and peaceful that I laughed out loud. I guess I laughed because my first snowstorm was over, and it had not been so terrible after all. Then I shouted, I did it! My voice never got very far. It was hushed by the tons of snow. I looked for signs of the barren weasel. His footsteps were all over the boulder, also slides where he had played. He must have been up for hours enjoying the new snow. Inspired by his fun, I poked my head into my tree and whistled. Frightful, my trained falcon flew to my fist, and we jumped and slid down the mountain, making big holes and trenches as we went. It was good to be whistling and carefree again, because I sure was sure scared by the coming of that storm. I had been working since May, learning how to make a fire with flint and steel, finding what plants I could eat, how to trap animals and catch fish, all that so when the curtain of blizzard struck the Catskills, I could crawl inside my tree and be comfortably warm and have plenty to eat. So again, it sounds like we're, we're there's a little bit of flashing forward and back. He's flashing to current time and then thinking about how he prepared for this time of being in the tree during the blizzard. Okay, so that was chapter one. Let's go on to chapter two. During the summer and fall, I had thought about the coming of winter, or I think we're actually still on chapter one. However, on the third day of December, when the sky blackened, the temperature dropped, and the first flakes swirled around me, I must admit that I wanted to run back to New York. Even the first night that I spent out in the woods, when I couldn't get the fire started, was night as frightening as the snowstorm that gathered behind the gorge and mushroomed up over my mountain. I was smoking three trout. It was nine o'clock in the morning. I was keeping busy, keep busy keeping the flames low so they would not leap up and burn the fish. As I worked, it occurred to me that it was awfully dark for that hour of the morning. So he's talking about as the he's talking about what he was doing when the blizzard came. Frightful was leashed to her tree stub. She seemed restless and pulled at her tethers. And a tether is like something that's connecting the bird to a post. Then I realized that the forest was dead quiet. Even the woodpeckers that had been tapping around me all morning were silent. The squirrels were nowhere to be seen. The juncos and chickadees and nuthatches were gone. I looked up to see that the barren weasel was doing. He was not around. I looked up. From my tree, you can see the gorge beyond the meadow. White water pours between the wet, black wet boulders and cascades into the valley below. The water that day was dark as the rocks. Only the sound told me it was still falling. Above the darkness stood another darkness, the clouds of winter, black and fearsome. They looked as wild as the winds that were bringing them. Oh, and there again, there's another personification, wild as the winds that were bringing them. I grew sick with fright. I knew I had enough food. I knew everything was going to be perfectly all right, but knowing that didn't help. I was scared. I stamped at the fire and pocketed the fish. I tried to wish, whistle for frightful, but I couldn't purse my shaking lips until I had enough time to get out anything but a <sighs> So I grabbed her by the hide straps that had attached to her legs and we dove through the deerskin door in my room in the tree, into my room in the tree. I put Frightful on the bedpost and curled up in a ball on the bed. I thought about New York and the noise and the lights and how a snowstorm always seemed friendly there. I thought about our apartment too. And at that moment, it seemed bright and lighted and warm. I had to keep saying to myself, there were 11 of us in it. Dad, mother, four sisters, four brothers, and me. And not one of us liked it, except perhaps little Nina, who was too young to know. Dad didn't like it even a little bit. He had been a sailor once. But when I was born, he gave up the sea and worked on the docks in New York. Dad didn't like the land. He liked the sea, wet and big and endless. 
Sometimes he would tell me about great-grandfather Gribbly, who owned land in the Catskill Mountains and felled the trees, which I believe means to cut down the trees, and built a home and plowed the land, only to discover that he wanted to be a sailor. The farm failed and great-grandfather Gribbly went to sea. As I, so we're finding out a little bit about his family. Sounds like he had lots of brothers and sisters, right? Four sisters and four brothers. And they didn't, they lived in New York in a tiny an apartment. So think about all those people living together in one little apartment. Um, and that his grandfather had a farm in the Catskill Mountains, but then failed. And so then he went out to sea. As I lay with my face buried in the sweet, greasy smell of my deer skin, I could hear dad's voice saying, that land is still in the family's name. Somewhere in the Catskills is an old beach with the name Gribbly carved on it. It marks the northern boundary of Gribbly's folly. The land is no place for a Gribbly. The land is no place for a Gribbly, I said. The land is no place for a Gribbly. And here I am 300 feet from the beach with Gribbly carved on it. So he, so we now we know that he has found the place where his family, the, the land that his family owned. I fell asleep at that point, and when I woke, I was hungry. I cracked some walnuts down, got down the acorn flour I had pounded with a bit of ash to remove the bite, reached out of the door for a little snow, and stirred up some acorn pancakes. I cooked them on top of a tin can, and as I ate them, smothered them with blueberry jam. I knew that the land was just the place for a gribbly. So we're finding that he's been quite successful in his... His living off the land. So this is chapter two in which I get started on this venture. An adventure again is a dangerous journey. I left New York in May. I had a penknife, a ball of 